Reading from the first book of Samuel. During the time young Samuel was ministered to the Lord under Eli, a revelation of the Lord was uncommon and vision infrequent. One day Eli was asleep in his usual place. His eyes had lately grown so weak that he could not see. The lamp of God was not yet extinguished and Samuel was sleeping in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. The Lord called to Samuel, who answered, Here I am. Samuel ran to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me? I did not call you, Eli said, go back to sleep. So he went back to sleep. Again the Lord called Samuel, who rose and went to Eli. Here I am, he said, you called me. But Eli answered, I did not call you, my son, go back to sleep. At that time Samuel was not familiar with the Lord, because the Lord had not revealed anything to him as yet. The Lord called Samuel again for the third time. Getting up and going to Eli, he said, Here I am, you called me. Then Eli understood that the Lord was calling the youth. So Eli said to Samuel, Go to sleep, and if you are called, reply, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. When Samuel went to sleep in his place, the Lord came and revealed his presence, calling out as before, Samuel, Samuel. Samuel answered, Speak, for your servant is listening. Samuel grew up, and the Lord was with him, not permitting any word of his to be without effect. Thus all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, came to know that Samuel was a credited prophet of the Lord. Hear my Lord, I come to do your will. I have waited, waited for the Lord, and he stooped toward me and heard my cry. Blessed the man who makes the Lord his trust, who turns not to idolatry or to those who stray after falsehood. Sacrifice or oblation you wished not, but ears open to obedience you gave me burnt offerings or sin offerings you sought not. Then I said, Behold, I come. In the written scroll it is prescribed for me, to do your will, O my God, is my delight, and your law is within my heart. I announced your justice in the vast assembly, I did not restrain my lips, as you, O Lord, know.
Dominus Fabiscum. Et cum Spiritus Tuus. Lexio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Marcum. Gloria Domine. On leaving the synagogue, Jesus entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Simon's mother-in-law lay sick with a fever. They immediately told him about her. He approached, grasped her hand, and helped her up. Then the fever left her, and she waited on them. When it was evening after sunset, they brought to him all who were ill or possessed by demons. The whole town was gathered at the door. He cured many who were sick with various diseases, and he drove out many demons, not permitting them to speak because they knew him. Rising very early before dawn, he left and went off to a deserted place where he prayed. Simon and those who were with him pursued him, and on finding him said, Everyone is looking for you. He told them, Let us go on to the nearby villages, that I may preach there also. For this purpose have I come. So he went into their synagogues, preaching and driving out demons throughout the whole of Galilee. Verbum Domini. On this Sunday, January 15th, there will be one high school football player in the United States who will be selected for as the winner of the Rudy Award. And the ones that will choose this are made up of some NFL football greats, Troy Aikman, Drew Blebsoe, Sean Alexander, among others. And I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Rudy, but it's based on a true story about a man, Daniel Rudiger, who played for the University of Notre Dame, or at least that was always his desire. And he overcame great and tremendous obstacles in order to realize that dream, one of which he was just simply too small. And so there will be this Sunday there will be a, a young man who will be selected for the Rudy Award. And these are young men and who even in their young lives have had tremendous obstacles to face. And yet they have continued to persevere even in the midst of those trials and their difficulties. Uh, today's Mass is being offered for the sick, and I'm thinking especially of our viewers, all of those who are with us through television and radio, who are suffering with various afflictions and diseases, as we heard in today's gospel, that they were brought to Jesus, and he brought them healing. He brought them divine help and consolation. And so today's Mass and our prayers are especially for all of you in our intercessions today, that the Lord Jesus, through the merits of his suffering and his death and his resurrection may bring you healing and divine help. But just to look at some of the uh, things that these young men have had to overcome, because I think in every life there are challenges, there are things that we need to rise above and to have that hope alive in our heart that somehow in some way that God is turning this to good. And among the 12 finalists are these young men. Quinton Anderson of Joplin, Missouri. You remember the terrible tornado. He lost his two parents in that tornado and his own legs were severely injured. But he still, this past fall, attended weekly practice cheering on his teammates from the sidelines. 
Caleb Mackey from Afton, Oklahoma, who has cerebral palsy, but he continues to play as a lineman. Addison Marshall from Fullshear, Texas. They were uprooted uh, from Hurricane Katrina in 2005, and then he's been battling with leukemia. But he returned to the field this past season. Daisman Patterson of Platte City, Florida. He helps his single mother care for two younger siblings and several foster children. Juan Diego Temple of San Juan Capistrano, California, lost his dad to cancer in 2009, but he's active in his school's community outreach program. Andrew Thomas of Chad's Fort, Pennsylvania, his, when his dad was out of work, this nose guard started a lawn care business to support the family. His dad found a job out of state, and then his mom suffered a stroke, so Thomas, a team captain, is caring for his five siblings. Well, one of them that I'm especially interested in goes to the same high school that I attended. His name is Matt Rineker. Matt Rineker from Luxembourg, Iowa. And because of an accident he had on the farm, his right leg had to be uh, amputated in his calf, up to his calf. But this past season, he returned to the field with a prosthesis. And his mother, or his father said this, he said, people have been wondering these little hurdles in life, can we jump over these hurdles and continue on with the race or lay over and play dead? He is definitely a good inspiration in that way. And his mother Judy said, now little things in life don't bother me and I try to look at the bright side of everything. It's helped my attitude in everyday life that no matter what challenge you have, you just strive to meet that challenge. I heard a talk by Nick Saban, the head coach of the uh, national champion Alabama Crimson Tide. And he talked about in his young life that a priest gave him a book by Scott Peck called The Road Less Traveled By. And the first sentence in that, in that book is, life is difficult. And when he read that, he's wondering, why is this priest giving me a book that begins, life is difficult? I want to hear good things. I don't want to hear this. And yet, and this, I'll just read the first few sentences of, of this book. Life is difficult. This is a great truth, one of the greatest truths. It's a great truth because once we truly see this truth, we transcend it. Once we truly know that life is difficult, once we truly understand and accept it, then life is no longer difficult. Because once it is accepted, the fact that life is difficult no longer matters. Most do not fully see this truth that life is difficult. Instead, they moan more or less incessantly, noisily or subtly, about the enormity of their problems, their burdens and their difficulties, as if life were generally easy, as if life should be easy. They voice their belief noisily or subtly that their difficulties represent a unique kind of affliction that should not be and that has somehow been especially visited upon them or else upon their families, their tribe, their class, their nation, their race, or even their species and not upon others. I know about this moaning because I have done my share. Life is a series of problems. Do we want to moan about them or solve them? Do we want to teach our children to solve them? And so there is a lot of truth in that, isn't there, that we all have challenges, we all have difficulties. I mentioned a number of these young men who've had tremendous challenges in their young lives, and yet they are finalists for the Rudy Award because that didn't stop them. They continued on. 
And this is something that Nick Saban said that it taught him that lesson too, that you solve the problem, you seek to solve that, and you continue on with that, you know, that hope and that faith that we have in God. That's really the Christian way of life, is that we know that life throws a lot of challenges at us, and yet we have hope because we're not alone. And so the psalmist today in Psalm 40 said this, I waited. You ever feel like you're waiting for the solution to a problem? Well, he said, I've waited, waited for the Lord. He says it twice. I have waited, waited for the Lord. And he stooped toward me and heard my cry. Blessed the man who makes the Lord his trust, who turns not to idolatry. St. Francis talked about how when you go through difficulties, you can turn to vain things, to sinful things, trying to get some momentary delight, but it only increases your emptiness. And so the psalmist tells us that he waited but the Lord heard his cry. He stooped to him. Blessed is a man who makes the Lord his trust, who turns not to idolatry, who doesn't turn to vain things, to sinful things, who doesn't give up on the Lord, but he continues to wait and to trust and to hope, and he continues to put one step forward because he knows that he's not alone. He knows that the Lord is his strength, he knows that there's going to, the Lord is going to stoop to him. He's going to help him. There is a book, and I love the picture on the front cover, and it's a book by a man by the name of John Fopp. It's a Catholic man in his 30s who was born without arms. And the book that he wrote, it's got a picture of him holding a coffee cup in his toes, holding it up to drink. He has no arms. And the title of that book is, What's Your Excuse? And in this book, he talks about how we can all find excuses for not doing what we really need to do. And he says there's a difference between an excuse and an explanation. The big difference between an excuse and an explanation is this. An excuse is offered to seek a way out of a challenge. An explanation is offered to seek a way into a solution. So we can say, well, it's just impossible. I can't do it. I have this against me. I got this challenge. Or we can say, yes, I have this challenge I have to rise above, but there's a solution, and the Lord is going to show me the way. Or at least I know that he's going to bring some good out of it, and still he's going to, that I can use this even to my advantage in some way. And John talks about when he was 10 years old, that his parents introduced him to a minister, Dr. Wilkie, who was born without arms, like himself and explain to young John how he managed to still be independent. John wanted nothing to do with it. He was happy with his brothers helping him to get dressed and so on. In addition to this, John was becoming more defiant at school and began failing some classes, obsessed and angry at his physical condition. His mother informed his brothers that they were not to help him to get dressed anymore, that John's attitude was bad and getting him in trouble at school and preventing him from helping himself. Little John was outraged. You are the worst mother in the world, he yelled at his mother. And though she was hurt, she knew that this was best and she left. Struggling in tears, and in tears, John wrote this. I came to the point at which I realized that my anger at God had brought me no relief, 
only further pain. In the stillness of that epiphany moment, I felt God's presence all around me. In my heart, I heard him softly say, if you let me, John, I will help you. I said, yes. Something powerful and I believe divine happened to me in that moment. I no longer faced my problems alone. I made the first move away from being stubborn and toward being strong. And he said, Mom had the ability to look past the pain she might be causing me in that immediate moment of my life and focus on the freedom that she knew I could enjoy if I were physically independent. She had an intuitive understanding that every, with every yes, there is a no. And conversely, with every no, there is a yes. In saying no more help for Johnny, she was providing a yes for many opportunities that lay ahead for me, of which, was, which required greater self-reliance. You know, we live in a culture where we idolize the youth. In fact, one of the fastest growing medical fields is cosmetic surgery. We spend billions in trying to reverse or slow down the aging process. And tonight on EWTN, there is a program by Father, with Father James Bracken of the Priests of the Sacred Heart and the title of it is Blessing of Aging. And here's what he says, something that is very contrary to what our culture tells us today. Aging is the fulfillment of life and not a curse. And he goes on to say that we are on a journey and as we get older, there's a certain dis diminishment, isn't there, in our abilities, in our strength. Yet at the same time, there's a spiritual growth, we pray, a, a growth in wisdom and understanding of the things that really matter in life. But what did John the Baptist say? He must increase, I must decrease. And isn't that what aging is forcing us to embrace? for our own good, really, as St. Paul said, that my body's wasting away, but my inner spirit's being renewed each day. So he must increase and I must decrease. And so he, su he suggests this, he says, with each ache, pain, unexpected sickness, or unexpected dis diminishment, Jesus will give us a little nudge to open the door to enhanced intimacy with him. When we attempt to live in the illusion of perpetual youth, we only hinder the process of our growth and our intimacy with Jesus. So perhaps that's a program you may find helpful this evening. It's on at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Time, 5.30 p.m. Central Time, The Blessing of Aging. So life is difficult. And yet, we are not alone in the challenges we face. In fact, the Lord will use those very things as a stepping stone for us to grow in virtue, in holiness, in intimacy with himself. May many of those in our audience who have various challenges and illnesses and the gospel today related, they came to Jesus May Jesus bring them consolation, help, and healing, and mostly his presence to assist them in the challenges of life.